Hello? Yes. Now they can hear. Push? No. No, don't. Hello? Yeah, just when a green button's on. Um, Hello, everyone. If you can all take your places, we can start a little earlier because we have an amazing panel and lots to talk about. So I don't want to waste another minute and I want to leave lots of time for questions. So um, welcome, everyone, um, to our panel on uh, the importance of investigating and reporting on war crimes. We have a great and amazing panel here. So I'll give a quick run through of introductions and then we have a lovely video for you to watch. Very short, but very interesting. I'm very particularly excited about this panel because all of our uh, speakers here are very experienced. They all happen to be women, but that's incidental, but that also happens to be fairly rare for this type of thing because your typical war correspondent that we usually think about for a long time has been for a long time male, but these are very enormously experienced women. And I think that gives a particular uh, interesting layer uh, to their uh, reflections as well. So I'll just, without further ado, uh, jump into introductions. To my extreme right here in a lovely lilac jacket is Ida Sawyer. She is the director of our crisis and conflict divisions at Human Rights Watch. That's the arm of Human Rights Watch that responds to global crisis from Ukraine to Syria to Yemen. And she was previously the organization's deputy Africa director. Janine Di Giovanni on my left here is the co-founder and executive director of The Reckoning Project, which partners journalists with lawyers to document war crimes in Ukraine. Now Janine has worked for many, many years, over 35 years as a war correspondent and also written many books. She has a much more extensive bio, but you can read about it in your own time. Indira Lakshmanan here is the global enterprise editor at the Associated Press. And before that, she worked in senior positions at National Geographic and the Pulitzer Center. And like Janine, she has reported from multiple countries. Again, long bio, you can read it in your own time. I'm Mei Fong, I am the uh, media director at uh, Human Rights Watch. Welcome everyone. Um, before we start um, with our discussion, we have a very short video to show you, uh, which is all, which will give you a good idea about what we're going to be talking about. Do you want to take it away? Когда папу забрали, я вообще пытался не думать об этом. Это не объяснял мне папа. Нам говорили, один дядя вообще сказал то, то, что он вернется через 7 лет. Они сначала спросили у меня, давай мы вас отправим троих в одну семью ненадолго, ну, на время, пока папа сможет нас забрать или мы вас сможем отвезти. Или э, в приют. Я сказал, я не дам ответа, пока с папой не свяжусь. Ту картину, яку побачила я, когда заглянула туда, где это спортзал, где сама больше кимната. Вот это настоящее пекло. Пекло в том виде, в котором малюют на старовинных иконах. В светле, в таком приглушенном, чисто от свечок, Постаті людей один коло одного сидять. Вони не били по голові, це по ногах, по тулубу. Було ще декілька ударів. Чому такі удари, якісь зековські, коли бліть ладошками, зразу по двох ушах дуже сильно вдав. І таке відчуття, що як контузія в тебе. І коли ти падаєш, тебе піднімають, роздягають. Дві-три години ти взагалі стоїш голий, холодно, просто замерзаєш. Дуже багато погибших, багато ранених. Ранених дуже важко, з ампутаціями. Ну і погибші люди теж дуже сильно повреждені тіла. Море крові, стони, крики, допомогите. Я чекав за чого ще два на час, я не знаю, я не зрозуміла. Потім встаю така і дивлю ногу, а тут у мене вся в крові. Вот. Вот что сейчас моя нога. А мужчина этот меня хватает, тянет, говорит, не смотрите, не смотрите. Я вырвалась, подбежала, приподняла. Я вижу, да, 
Не вижу того, не вижу. Так живут скрытые, знаете, как кожа вот так снятая. И я вижу полностью все его внутренности. И он у меня спросил, как ваше здоровье. Естественно, я поняла, что это врач. Я ответила, что все у меня, все у меня хорошо. И он сказал, ну, если хорошо, то завтра будем снимать швы. Я даже не спросила, где эти швы. Ну, это, только он сказал, что у нас нет обезболивающего. Вы, можете, вы будете терпеть? Я говорю, буду терпеть. А я бомба упала вот за этим окном. Где я была, я не знаю. Но... Где-то была, что осталась жива. Это запуганные люди. Они издевались так над ними. Просто это ну, зверски. Они были избиты до такой степени. Это стоит мужчина, ну вот, мужчина. Но на нем нету живого. Это, это просто сплошная гематома. Рассказывали, что и уши и ток пускали. Вот отстрел. Роддом. Это была девочка, которая, ну, которой мы пытались оказать помощь. К большому сожалению, ребенок был уже мертв. Нам не удалось спасти ни мать, ни ребенка. Я не смог положить младенца э, в пакет ну, с женщиной. Это сделал мой коллега. Тяжело. Okay, just to start us off, um, Ida, could you tell us what exactly is a war crime and what's not a war crime? And what are the key questions that journalists should be asking when reporting on potential laws of war violations? Great, thanks May and hi everyone. It's great to be with you. So what's a war crime? War crimes are defined as serious violations of international humanitarian law or the laws of war that are committed by individuals with criminal intent. So the first test when looking at whether something's a war crime is to determine whether a particular incident violated the laws of war. And this is the body of international law that applies during armed conflicts to regulate how wars are fought. And this includes rules that minimize harm to civilians and civilian structures and to captured and injured soldiers and fighters. And the laws of war clearly prohibit deliberate attacks on civilians and civilian objects attacks that can't discriminate or distinguish between combatants and civilians, and attacks that could be expected to cause disproportionate civilian harm compared to any concrete military advantage. So for a violation of the laws of war to then be a war crime, we need to show that it was serious and that there was criminal intent. So that means, was it deliberate, meaning the attack purposefully targeted civilians, or was it reckless, meaning that they could or should have known the risk to civilians but went ahead anyway? And in some cases, it can be fairly straightforward. So if you have members of an armed force willfully torturing, mistreating, killing civilians or captured combatants, or carrying out unlawful deportations or tra force transfers, that's likely a war crime. But it gets much more complicated when we're talking about bombing and shelling in civilian areas. There, it can be important to look at what weapon was used, was it an inherently indiscriminate weapon that's banned under international law, like landmines, anti-personnel landmines or cluster munitions? And then what was hit? What was the target? Was it an apartment building, a school, a hospital, or a shopping mall? And all of these are generally civilian objects, meaning they don't usually serve a military purpose. But what if the military was using the school as a base? Or what if high-level military officers happened to be meeting there? Or what if the apartment building that was hit was next to a weapons depot? So it's often more complicated than it seems. And it's really important to, to just really dig and investigate to try to understand the full picture before jumping to any conclusions. And even if a large number of civilians were killed in an attack, it's not necessarily a war crime. So just an example from Ukraine, last summer there was an attack on a cultural center in Venezia, really horrific attack, 23 people killed, including three children. But after we started investigating, it appeared that senior Ukrainian military officers were holding a meeting in the building at the time of the attack and may have been among the victims. 
So if this is true, then the building would have been a legitimate military target and therefore not necessarily unlawful or a war crime, despite the high civilian casualties. It also gets complicated when we're talking about what's called dual use infrastructure. And this means objects or buildings that have both a civilian and a military use. So this can include train stations, train tracks, or power electricity infrastructure, since both the military and civilians can rely on these things. And it can often be hard for us as human rights investigators or journalists to assess you know, what's the concrete military advantage of attacking a train station or attacking a power station, for example. But if we find that the attacks are indiscriminate and have a disproportionate impact on civilians, they can still be unlawful. So you might remember there were repeated attacks on power infrastructure across Ukraine last fall, um, which were often far from the front lines and deprived millions of residents of at least temporary access to power, water, and heating ahead of the very cold winter months. And in this case, because of that overwhelming impact on civilians, we found that Russia appeared to be seeking to unlawfully create terror among civilians and make life unsustainable for them. So even though the power infrastructure had a military use, we found those attacks to be unlawful. And then another key part of the investigation is to try to figure out who's responsible, which armed force, and then, if possible, the specific units and commanders. And with this, it's also really important not to make assumptions, not just follow the pack, but to look for independent sources and evidence. And it can sometimes be more complicated than it appears. So an example from Ukraine this past year, where in the overwhelming majority of abuses we and others have documented were carried out by Russian forces. But when we got, uh, when Ukrainian forces re regained control of the area around Izum, following six months of Russian occupation, the city was full of banned landmines and many civilians were injured and some had to have their feet and lower legs amputated. And many immediately assumed that Russian forces laid the landmines and were responsible but we spent several weeks investigating on the ground, and we found that, in fact, in this particular instance, uh, the landmines had been fired by rocket from Ukrainian positions outside of Izum during a series of attacks throughout Russia's occupation. So it wasn't how it at first appeared, and it was important to do that in-depth investigation. So there's more we can get into, but these are just some of the key initial issues to look out for when documenting and reporting on war crimes. It's often very complicated. It can take weeks or months to get the information we need to help determine whether we can call something unlawful or an apparent war crime. And then it can take judicial investigators much longer to get the evidence they need to prove a case in court. And journalists, of course, aren't expected to make legal determinations, but it can help to ask these types of questions when doing initial reporting on an incident. Was there a military presence at or around the area that was hit? Was a civilian object targeted, or was it dual use? What weapon was used? What was the impact on civilians? This can all be really helpful for human rights and judicial investigators later on. And then, of course, it's important not to jump to conclusions and just call something a war crime because it seemed like a horrific attack, and to consult with legal experts whenever possible. And really to try to resist any pressure from newsrooms or editors who might want to be pushing for a sensational headline to get out as quickly as possible. But sometimes it's better you know, to take the time and wait and do that investigation. Thanks, Thanks. Ida. So you've outlined some of the uh, pitfalls uh, that can happen when you're covering a war and um, as a journalist and you're looking for a strong story, but sometimes a strong story may not necessarily be a war crime story. So um, I'm gonna turn this to Janine. From your experience both as a journalist and with the Reckoning Project, can you sp speak a little bit about the role that journalists can play in helping to preserve evidence and s a little bit more about some of these pitfalls to avoid to ensure that you aren't unintentionally damaging evidence or re-traumatizing victims? How do you adhere to this principle of do no harm as a journalist Thanks. reporting on war crimes? Thanks, May. Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Janine. I'm the executive director of The Reckoning Project. Thanks so much for coming out in your very busy day. So I, I first want to go back to a point in time when many of you probably weren't even born, um, May 2000, to Freetown, Sierra Leone. I was working as a reporter there for the Times of London, 
um, and the city began to fall to rebel forces. Um, there were very few journalists there, and I, um, <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, the president, Ahmed Teja Kaba, fled because angry crowds were descending on his house. Well, as a journalist, I decided I was going to go into his house and steal his documents, which is what I did. I went in with a local guy, and we just saw that the president had fled, leaving extremely important documents linking the blood diamonds of Sierra Leone to uh, individuals who worked for the UN, governments, as well as a clear path going from Freetown to Antwerp to Hatton Gardens, London, the Diamond District, to New York. And I took these documents um, at great risk. The next day, the Minister of Justice called a press conference and said, one of you has taken something that I need and I will find you. And in a very stupid and naive way, I went up to him and I said, I have them, but uh, I'm not gonna give them to you until you give me an interview with the president. And he just looked at me and said something like, seriously, little girl, you are in Africa. Do you know what you are doing? And the answer was, I didn't know what I was doing. But I did give those documents to a British general who then gave them to the war crimes tribunal that would eventually come for Sierra Leone. So the point of this story is that journalists, I was a journalist, I reported 19 conflicts in depth, um, staying for long periods of time. And in these conflicts, I would witness atrocities, which I would put in my notebook, and I was a good reporter. My notebooks were good enough for Vanity Fair fact checkers or the Times fact checkers, but they weren't admissible in court. And I'd been called by The Hague three times, and sometimes I was very honest, and I just said, I don't remember. I don't remember what happened in Bosnia 20 years ago, or the witnesses had died, or they had aged out, or they didn't want to talk anymore. So when the full-scale invasion of Ukraine began last year, um, I had been working uh, as an academic, but also for the UN, running a project training Syrian, um, Iraqi, and Yemen journalists to understand exactly what Ida was saying. What is a war crime? How can you see it? How can you report it? Peter Pomerantsev, who many of you might know, is a great expert on Russian disinformation, phoned me and said, we've got to do something that has more impact. What can we do rather than just being journalists? So we founded the Reckoning Project. What we do is we found 30 Ukrainian journalists who are investigative journalists, very good journalists, locally. We train them to understand IHL law. Most importantly, we train them in our methodology, and this is the point that I think May was making. So very different from being a journalist, the journalist that I was used to, in this concept of do no harm, meaning you do not interview traumatized victims. You don't, you're not under a deadline for the Sunday Times to get a headline that's sensationalized. You're taking your time. You're making sure that they are not in danger when you're interviewing them. You're not asking leading questions, which is something you know most journalists do ask subconsciously. Um, and you are verifying your information. So what we do, in a nutshell, we have our 30 researchers. They were journalists. They're now human rights monitors. They go in the field, they're from the villages, they're from the towns, they're local. And this is a huge point for us because it means people trust them. It means that they have, it also means they're getting some kind of agency over, if your country is invaded and you're at war and it is absolutely horrific, to feel that you're not doing anything is the worst feeling in the world. So they, they feel like they're contributing to justice, which we are, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, we then verify it using OSINT. We work with Bellingcat, we work with Stanford, Starling Lab, and then we have our archive. On one hand, we help the prosecutors. So we build cases, we're working very closely with the Ukrainian national courts, but also with the ICC um, and with universal jurisdiction. Um, and then we also use these very granular witness statements to build journalistic storytelling. So we publish in many media, Foreign Affairs, Vanity Fair, The Guardian, the cover of Time. Um, but it's a way of countering disinformation because no one can say 
you made this up. It's there. It's been verified. And for me personally, I've lived through three genocides in my life. And the victims of those genocides that are still alive have to endure history being rewritten. That's in Rwanda and Bosnia, and the Yazidi slaughter as well. So this is a way of ensuring that the lasting memorial, that this is what happened. We can never take this away from people. So the pitfalls I think we have to avoid the most are, um, there's a gray area between, and, and Indira will talk about the journalism side of it, but there is a very gray area between journalists going in the field and calling out a war crime when, as Ida said, it's not yet determined that it's a war crime. So I think not all journalists can be trained in IHL law, but it would help many of you who are going into the field to, to get a day training with, with you know, pro bono lawyers. Many lawyers will do this. Um, to also familiarize yourself with you know, the difference of the rules of law, with IHL law, with the difference between a war crime and a crime against humanity, or a crime of aggression, which is actually a crime of peace. Um, these are all really important. Finally, I just want to say the film you saw that my team, my Ukrainian team made, um, was shown at Congress yesterday. So the Reckoning Project, our tiny little small but mighty unit of nearly all women, by the way, because the men are fighting on the front line, um, has had impact in one year. You know, Congress chose us to show our evidence and people were brought from Ukraine to give children who had been stolen um, and others. So I don't know if you would call us journalists, and I think Indira is going to talk about her project at AP, but I think we are a really good example of a hybrid um, human rights organization that's working really hard to stamp out the plague of impunity, which is what drives all of us. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Janine. Um, I know some of you will have questions. So we're going to put a little bit of a pin in this. I want to turn to Indira at this point and ask about uh, from the journalistic standpoint, Indira, you've been reporting, editing, reporting on war crimes since Bosnia in the 1990s to Ukraine today. So how has this changed? Um, what's important now that wasn't possible then or wasn't even a concern when you first began reporting on war crimes? Well, thank you so much, May, um, and thank you all so much for coming um, to this talk and really appreciate your being here to listen to this. Um, I would say that Yes, in 30 years as, as a foreign correspondent and now an editor, the most difficult things I've ever reported on are uh, fall within what we would call warm war crimes, but also some of it just crimes against civilians in war zones. Um, I wanted to sort of simplify Ida's definition because her definition is absolutely right, and that's something that war crimes investigators and prosecutors have to use to determine. But as a journalist, we go in and we write about human suffering and the causes of human suffering, even if it's not specifically a war crime. So the sort of simplified um, you know, version of all of these war crimes, it includes murder, mutilation, torture, hostage taking, intentional attacks against the civilians um, or certain buildings like hospitals and science and charitable organizations, also pillaging, rape, sexual slavery, forced pregnancy, and conscripting children under the age of 15. So these are things that all of us who've, who've reported from war zones have seen firsthand. And I think that I just want to make the point that when we report this, we're documenting this for the public. Our purpose as journalists is to be the eyes and ears and to sort of, you know, document history so people can know about it. We're not the same as war crimes investigators. We're not the same as lawyers. So I don't think we can, exp I think we have to hold ourselves to the standards, the extremely high standards, that everything we do is accurate and true and documented. That's critically important. But we can't go into a conflict zone as reporters acting as if we are lawyers or human rights investigators because they have their role and we as journalists have a different role. So I'll say that in Bosnia in the 1990s, every refugee camp I went to, I met women who had been, who were survivors of 
rape used as a tool of war. Every village I went to, I met people who had been deported out of their own home villages. Uh, I remember one particular village where they were literally digging up their dead from the graves and putting them onto horse carts because they needed to take the dead bodies with them because they were being pushed across a border. So there is so, you know, there are countless cases, and I'm seeing in here one of my friends and colleagues, Bobby Ghosh, who reported from Iraq, who saw, you know, similar, different things, but other war crimes that, that you would see in these places. What I want to, what I just say about reporting in Bosnia 30 years ago versus today is so much has changed. Back then, we were, you know, with notebooks, writing things down, with cameras, taking pictures, very carefully documenting everything from the voices of people to jump forward some years to Afghanistan. Um, someone made a mention of evidence, and you don't want to hurt evidence. At the same time, you come into a former al-Qaeda camp the day after the fall of the Taliban, and you can't not pick up the, the, the notebooks and the documents in which people are making plans for attacks. You pick those up, you put them in your knapsack, and you're using them to write stories. Um, is that potentially interfering with evidence? In this case, it wasn't of war crimes, but there was so much of it that reporters picked up many of those documents before US Marines or United Nations people got there. I just want to say that it's really important in these war zones to take your sensitivity with you and put yourself in the shoes of the people who, as Janine said, are traumatized and you're not wanting to re-traumatize them. When I say re-traumatize them, they're living in trauma. So it's not like the trauma stops when they meet a reporter. So you really have to be sensitive. And I almost wish that there would be sensitivity classes that would be given in every newsroom some of this is just being a nice human being, but I wish that editors would talk more to reporters about how you comport yourself and how you behave around people who've undergone trauma that most of us, thank God, could never imagine and hopefully will never experience. There's that famous old saw um, from, you know, the, the question that was shouted repeatedly by a UK television reporter to women and children who were fleeing the newly independent Zaire, which was, anyone here been raped who speaks English? You know, you've probably heard that, that quote. It's a real quote, and it's the attitude that it exemplifies of many people who are just going in quickly trying to get the story. So what I would say is, in all of these war zones, I would say first, you know, you have to put your, forward your role as an information gatherer and a chronicler um, for now, for today, for the news, and for history, and you have to be sensitive to the people who you're reporting on. I want to say a bit about the work that the AP, that my colleagues at the AP have done um, in the last year reporting on war crimes in Bucha and Mariupol. Um, Technology has changed so much between um, the 1990s and today. It is stunning. So right now, it's not just with your notebook and your camera. It's AP got feeds from all sorts of sources. Initially, it was the Center for Information Resilience and Bellingcat, who had web scrapers, who were the main sources. The AP then assigned reporters, several of whom were trained by Bellingcat, to use forensic analysis techniques to verify that the photo actually was, or the video was, what it said it was. So for example, if um, an image showed a body being pulled from rubble and claimed that it was a school, the reporters would use a variety of reverse image tools to geolocate the building. Then they'd compare satellite imagery from shortly before the attack to ensure that the building actually was intact before the attack took place. Then they would look at the school's website and get details of who might have been there to try to track victims that way. Then they would contact school or city officials and they'd get AP reporters to verify on the ground what happened. Of course, we had scores of reporters who were on the ground. Um, Another important element was that the AP team had several sessions with war crimes prosecutors who gave tutorials on the Rome Statute and the Geneva Conventions. This goes to what Janine was saying about getting training on the law. And reporters checked with them when they weren't certain whether a, cer whether a specific attack would constitute a violation or a war crime or not. Um, the result of this, I think, is incredible work that um, 
you may have seen the frontline video, the PBS frontline video that was done together. It was an AP frontline collaboration that has a long entire page about the methodology that was used. And I think that's incredibly important that you should put out there what your methodology is. This is one place where transparency is critical because when you're going to have actors of disinformation or questioners or the Russian government saying this is all just fake stuff that the AP is putting up. You can point to the methodology and say, no, in fact, here's the evidence, here's how we tracked it, here's how we traced it. Cell phones were really critical and have been critical in this war in a way that, again, was impossible in Bosnia 30 years ago. Ordinary people were documenting what was happening in real time and they were posting it onto Telegram, Twitter, Facebook, VK, which is a Russian social media network, and other places. So I just want to say that, of course, we're not investigators, we're not a court of law. For a court of law, investigators would presumably have to find the people who took the original photos and get them to attest to what they saw. But our role, again, is different. Our role is journalism. Um, I. I do think that it's, it, it, there's also the point that what AP was tracking were evidence by each event and by each attack. And in that case, each attack or event can spawn multiple criminal charges. So for example, the March 16th airstrike last year on the theater in Mariupol, we listed as a single event, but it could actually in the end spawn hundreds of war crimes charges because an estimated 600 people were killed. So the numbers aren't gonna exactly line up with the numbers that you hear cited by Ukrainian or international war crimes prosecutors, um, but there, that's the reason for that, and we explain that and make that, um, you know, very transparent. Um, I want to just make one point, which I think is interesting, that war crimes investigators do collaborate with journalists, but they also have their limits to how they can collaborate. So. Um, the, the woman who is the Ukrainian human rights lawyer who was one of the co-winners of the Nobel Peace Prize last year, she met in Washington with the, our global head of investigations before she got the Nobel Prize. And our team was trying to ask her to share some of her witness um, testimonials. I'm, I'm referring to Alexandra Matvichuk. Um, our Sasha. team said, sorry? Sasha Matvichuk. Sasha. No, that her name's Alexandra, but we call her Sasha. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, sh she was asked to share her witness testimonials with us. And very interestingly, she said, well, I can share some things with you, but we've also offered witness confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And so she, in her role, could not share everything with the media because she had promised confidentiality to her witnesses. So that's a really important point, that we're in different lanes, and it's proper and appropriate for us to operate in different lanes um, for what we do. Well, thanks, Indira. This is a really, um, I, I just love the fact that all of you here have highlighted one key issue, which is that at the heart of all you do, whether you're a war crimes investigator or a journalist, truth, evidence, these are the key and the highlight. But you've highlighted <coughs> the role of how tech can play an important role in finding the truth, finding the evidence. But we also know right now that can also be used for disinformation or misinformation, whether deliberately or otherwise. So for you, Ida, what? how do you cut through all this when you're documenting war crimes? How has this changed the way that we all work nowadays? Yeah, thanks, May. So, I mean, as, as Indira mentioned, we've just seen such a massive increase in recent years in all of this open source information that's available dur during the armed conflicts we're working on. So, in some cases, we'll have hundreds or even thousands of photos and videos and real-time posts just about one specific incident or situation. And this creates a lot of new opportunities for documentation. So even if we don't have physical access to a particular location, we can find out a lot but it comes with many risks. So especially when we're seeing the prevalence of disinformation and misinformation, there are a lot of actors out there who are either intentionally or in some cases unintentionally spreading false or misleading narratives about what happened. So this really makes it all the more important for us to be extremely meticulous in our investigations and try as much as possible to combine the open source investigations, which at Human Rights Watch is led by our Digital Investigations Lab, and Sam 
is Deborah Lee is, is here in the audience. Um, so his team doing the open source investigations with the on-site investigations researchers on the ground, collecting the physical evidence on the ground as well as the visual evidence, and then also having what we gather from our interviews with key victims and witnesses. And then it's also really important how we visually present our research. How can we show our work in a compelling way to effectively counter or debunk all of the misinformation that's out there? So I'd like to just briefly go through an investigation that we published in fe February to help explain how we're trying to do this. So this was uh, a feature and a video that we did together with Situ Research on the Russian cluster munition attack on the crowded Kramatorsk train station in eastern Ukraine last April. And this attack killed at least 58 civilians and injured over 100 others who were all waiting to board evacuation trains to take them to relative safety in western UK Ukraine. And this was one of the deadliest single incidents for civilians since Russia's full-scale invasion. And Russia, after the attack, immediately denied responsibility, and they claimed that they were not using the Tochka missile system that had carried out the attack. So we then did a 10-month-long investigation, including on-site analysis of physical evidence in Kramatorsk. We went to a potential launch location at a former Russian military base, and then we interviewed dozens of victims and first responders and analyzed a lot of videos and satellite imagery and social media posts and did 3D modeling of the weapon itself and the train station. So one thing that we wanted to show was that the train station was a known evacuation site and that Russian forces should have known this. So we found public posts from local officials announcing the train timetable and urging people to evacuate. We documented how tens of thousands of people had evacuated through the station in the days before. And then we used video footage recorded just before the attack to count exactly how many people were at the train station at the time of the attack. So you can see that here, how we did that counting. And then we got to at least 511 people were present at the train station when the attack happened. So this was especially important given how I mentioned earlier that a train station is considered a dual use object. So it also could be a military target. But in this situation, it was clear that there weren't, we didn't find any evidence of military at or around the station. And clearly it was a major civilian evacuation hub. So we also felt it was really important for this report to, um, to identify the weapon and demonstrate, sorry, just trying to move to the next slide, um, to identify the weapon and demonstrate exactly how it works and why it's unlawful in a way that anyone could understand. So we made this model there. Um, so we made the model of the, the weapon that was used. It was a Tochka U ballistic missile equipped with a cluster munition warhead. Um, and this cluster munition exploded over the train station into and released 50 bomblets, which you can see here. And then they all spread in a wide area around the train station uh, and on the tracks in the surrounding area. And then each of those bomblets uh, shattered into a total of nearly 16,000 metal fragments. And many of these fragments are then what ended up in the bodies of the men, women, and children who were waiting at the train station, tearing off their limbs and causing fatal wounds for many of them. So our researchers on the ground, we had identified 32 of these submunition impact sites. So this is a model of just one of those sites, and you can see how one submunition then shatters into all of these different metal fragments that spread around the area. Um, and then we were able to correlate um, the locations of the submunition impact sites with the specific locations where people uh, died and were injured on the at the train station and on the platform. But then our big challenge for several months was figuring out where exactly the weapon was launched from and getting conclusive evidence that would allow us to say confidently that Russian forces were responsible and that they were using this Tochka missile system, which they had denied. Um, so after a lot of research, we eventually found satellite imagery of what appeared to be a Tochka missile container, uh, or Tochka missile containers and uh, remnants of the vehicles in a village called Kuni. Um, and this 
slide isn't plain, but it's that area in the dark area at the top there. Um, and that's just north of Izum, and Russian military forces had a major base there at the time of the attack. And after we found the satellite imagery from last April, we were then able to go to the village, which was by then under Ukrainian control, and our team found remnants of the Tochka missile launch vehicle and the storage containers, and we interviewed residents who described repeated major launches happening from this area during the time of the attack in April. So that allowed us to pretty definitively say that Russian forces did have the Tochka missile system in Russian-controlled territory within the missile's firing range of Kramatorsk around the time of the attack. So we then put this all together into a feature and a longer video, with, and we're able to make the conclusion that the attack, which used an inherently indiscriminate weapon, cluster munition, and a well-known evacuation hub, was a clear violation of the laws of war and an apparent war crime. And then we've used this to call for Russian commanders responsible for ordering the attack to be investigated and brought to justice. And we're also pushing for both Russia and Ukraine to join the convention on cluster munitions, which bans this weapon. Okay, I'm gonna leave a little room yes. for questions at the end here, because I know you have a lot, but before we do that, just one last one that I'm gonna take a prerogative as the uh, moderator here to ask one, which I know that a lot of people think about. You can see from all our speakers here how arduous the work is, how long it takes, how meticulous you have to be. And I think the big question in a lot of, I think the general public's mind is, and so what question, which is why does this matter? We know that documenting war crimes and bringing eventual war criminals to justice is a long and hard road. Sometimes it almost, you, it's, it, sometimes it never happens. You don't see these people in court or brought to justice in some way. So the answer what question that I'm gonna just quickly flip to all of you, starting with Janine and um, Indira and um, Ida is, why does this matter? So very quickly, and then we'll have questions from you. So the importance of this is really goes back to people, to individuals. Um, in Bosnia, I was in Bosnia for three years during the siege of Sarajevo, but I worked a lot on systematic rape. Now 16,000 women were raped in the rape camps of Foča and other places in eastern Bosnia. A handful, a handful of men were brought to the ICTY. So justice was never really delivered. In Rwanda, one million people were slaughtered in three months in 1994. One million people. And I remember standing by the side of the road and looking down as far as I could see the piles and piles and piles of bodies. But I could give this from any of the countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Congo, um, the people that never see justice. So it's this, it's justice that drives me and I think drives my colleagues. It's not getting a scoop in a newspaper. It's not winning an award. It's about the people who endure this and need to feel that they are getting some kind of justice or what you have is the cycle of violence repeating itself in 20 or 30 years time. Bosnia today, because there was no transitional justice, is on the verge of another conflict, sectarian conflict. And of course, Putin is stirring that one up. So I think, and I know we want to give time to everyone here, so I'm being very mindful of this, is that we really do it for all of those people that don't have a voice, that don't have a way of expressing themselves, that are in remote villages, that there is some sense of a rule of law that governs, that war is not just killing anyone you want to, that people will be held accountable. And that's what we do at the Reckoning Project. We've learned a lot from our friends at Human Rights Watch, who I've worked alongside for more than 30 years, and very grateful to the work you do. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Janine. Indira? Um, yes, I would say absolutely it's about accountability. It's about telling stories. I mean, as journalists, we call our, we're journalistic nonfiction storytellers. We have to be the voice for the voiceless. It's cliche, but that's what we do. So it's not even people just in remote villages. It's people everywhere who don't have the opportunity to tell their story. We have to be there to document it, to make sure it's accurate, to make sure it's documented for history, and also, hopefully, for transitional justice and accountability and prevention in the future. Yep. And that goes, you know, that's from Cambodia to Bosnia to, you know, all the way. Rwanda, I mean, we need accountability and 
we haven't seen it. I, I, I actually wanted to ask Ida about Sudan and what's happening right now and the documentation of those war crimes in real time. Yeah, thanks. So I'll just quickly give an example from Congo, where I lived for about nine years, and I spent much of that time documenting abuses by a warlord named Bosco Antaganda, whose troops were responsible for ethnic massacres, mass rapes, recruitment of children, targeted killing of civilians, as he moved from one armed group to another and was even a general in the army. The International Criminal Court eventually issued an arrest warrant for him, but he remained at large for many years. He was backed by neighboring Rwanda. Many believed he was untouchable. I was told again and again by diplomats and UN officials that he would never face justice for waste, wasting our time. But we kept up the pressure. We kept documenting his crimes. We kept documenting the support he was getting from Rwanda. And eventually, this led Rwanda's Western allies to put pressure on Rwanda to drop their, drop their support for Bosco. And he surrendered and was sent to The Hague. Eventually, he was convicted, sentenced for, to 30 years in, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So I think this shows that justice can take time, but with continued documentation, pressure, and persistence, we can eventually see results and show that there are real consequences for these crimes and ensure that victims do eventually see justice. But it also shows the price of waiting and that the longer impunity prevails, the more crimes we're likely to see. And that is sadly blatantly evident today in Sudan, where the failure to hold the generals responsible for their past crimes directly led to the conflict and immense suffering that we've been seeing over the past week. OK, now we're going to open up to questions. I'm just going to ask everybody to speak loudly um, and, um, wow. and uh, keep it short, no so boxing. OK, you first. <laughs> you know, when um, working on the battlefield. And I wanted to ask you if there are some differences between ethics that journalists need to follow and ethics that human rights investigators follow. I know there are some rules that have to be followed because you don't want to, you know, violate human rights when you're reporting about human rights. So that's my question. Yeah. Do no harm. I mean, I think do no harm is the, the mantra that we all... Sh some journalists do not follow this, I have to say. Um, there are certain newspapers that put immense pressure on journalists to come back with a scoop, and as a result, huge mistakes are made. For instance, calling out rape as systematic rape when it is not, or calling out a war crime, any photograph of something an atrocity is a war crime. But I think the thing that governs all of us, certainly Human Rights Watch and the Reckoning Project, is do no harm, and we try to be, the main thing is not re-traumatizing victims who are already deeply traumatized. And there's a whole series of methodology that we use that I'm, we could share with you another time. I know I see Mays getting impatient with it. Do No Harm governs, obviously, the Associated Press and I would say most mainstream established media. We follow standards and practices and we have news values that include not impersonating anyone, not pretending to be someone other than we are, you know, protecting people's identity if they need to be and identifying when people need to be anonymous. That's all laid out and very transparent in our rules and ethics. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it later after too. Okay, Thanks. next question. Um, how do you handle reporting in war zones uh, without having PTSD? Oh. We, yeah, we've got so who many said we don't? who works on that, yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, we were, I don't I think... I was part of a group, the first group of war, war reporters that were tested by Anthony Feinstein. I think Hannah's in the audience here who works on it very closely. Um, he followed us for three years um, trying to see how war reporters were affected by PTSD. Um, in the end, I didn't have it, and I said to him, why don't I have it? And everyone else does. And he said, because you write about it. And photographers at most risk are photographers and cameramen because they, they can't pro they're not processing it the way that writers can sit down and do it. But again, people like Hannah Storm, who's right there, who's an expert on it, could probably talk you through many ways of protecting yourself in war zones, which is very, very important. Okay, we're moving on, but obviously fascinating topic. Lots of, uh, you know, there. Um, the lady next to it, and then after that, the lady in blue. Yeah. Hi. Janine, I'd be interested to get your take on, um, I'm sure you remember there was a bit of a scandal within journalism a few years ago in Iraq when many files were taken, the ISIS files. I'd be interested yeah. to know, as someone who took files um, that belonged to yeah. 
Um, what are, what's the ethics behind this? When do you decide that this is a good idea, this is not a good idea? Yeah, I don't think I did the right thing by taking those files in Sierra Leone or, or other places that I've lifted files. But in the end, they were used in the war crimes tribunal to help make those war, the blood diamond links, which became so important. Um, look, do we, do we take documents from dictators, from Saddam? Um, I don't know. So I think Bobby, someone like that could probably answer that better than me. But I... I think the one thing that I would think about Sierra Leone was that that house was booby-trapped. <laughs> and I kind of went in like an idiot, blindly, just to get the documents. And in fact, I was lucky I wasn't blown up. In Iraq, it was, sorry, just one, in Iraq, there was a government who could have taken those documents and processed them themselves. I think it was a very different scenario, yeah. am I correct? Um, yeah, I'm um, sorry. We, we, I have threatening looks from the back. We have to get out of here. I want to leave the privilege for the last question to this lady here. Yeah. What is a good approach to the uh, treating the principle represent both sides when one side is clearly mm. criminal and committing genocide or war crimes? Indira, you want to take this? Mm. Sure. I, I don't believe in both sides journalism, and I don't think that, that personally that most news organizations practice that. I do think that it's necessary to state what other sides are saying, but that doesn't mean we give credence to it. And I do think... Um, you know, to me, it's very important to be very careful in your reporting to say, you know, XDX said this, however, the evidence shows blankety blank blank. You know, so if you're laying out that these war crimes occurred, you give all the evidence you did, and then you can say, and Russia denied it. But just denying it doesn't fight all of the evidence that you have documented from people on the ground. Okay, we have to clear the room. Obviously, we could spend ages talking about this, but thank you all. Thank you very much.